Hello and welcome to Newsmakers on CHCH Podcast. I'm your host, Louis Butko, and on today's show, I'm very pleased to be joined by Ontario NDP leader and leader of the opposition in the Legislative Assembly MPP, Marit Stiles. A former Toronto District School Board trustee and president of the Federal New Democrats, Ms. Stiles was elected as an MPP in the Toronto riding of Davenport in 2018 and served four years as education critic and was re-elected in 2022. She announced her candidacy for the leader of the Ontario NDP following now Hamilton Mayor Andrea Horvath's resignation in that role. And in February of last year, as the only candidate was acclaimed by the party taking office as the official leader of the opposition. Marit Stiles, thank you so much for joining us. Our uh, first party leader to join us on the Newsmakers podcast. Happy New Year to you and your family. Happy New Year to you. It's just such a pleasure to be here. I didn't know I was the first one, so that's great. I'm well, so we've, pleased to be here. we've talked to some of your uh, your MPPs at, uh, mm-hmm. on this show, and let's start there because uh, the news of the day, a couple of your MPPs are down there at the Sheridan right now uh, as the uh, Ontario budget deliberations begin. What are you hoping to see in Doug Ford's budget in 2024? Well, look, I mean, last year, I mean, certainly the last year in particular has been really tough for a lot of people. And uh, I know a lot of people are out there are are struggling to pay their bills. Uh, Costs keep going up. Wages are staying the same. Uh, So what we're hoping to see from the government are some some uh, policy changes that will address that that issue. Uh, But we also need to see them uh, address the housing crisis. Uh, the health care crisis. And of course, uh, we want to see them, uh, we want to see them address this corruption uh, that we've seen throughout government. Uh, we did see the government reverse course on a number of really big policy issues like like the Green Belt. And, and by the way, thank you to the people of Hamilton who, who spoke up so loudly. Uh, and really, you know, this is their win as well, for sure. Uh, but, but, you know, we've We've seen the government reverse course on a number of their really bad policies, and we're hoping that uh, in the upcoming budget we'll see more reversals as well. As mentioned, it will be uh, one year officially on February 4th that you have been a leader of the opposition as the leader of the NDP. What have you learned about yourself in, in this past 11 months as a leader, as a politician, as a person? What have you taken away from that first year as the leader of the party? Wow, what a, what a great question. Uh, look, I, I would say what I've what I've taken away is that I I really do. Uh, I really I've always known that I like to to meet people, that I like to learn people's stories. Uh, That's very handy when you're in the kind of job I'm in right now. Uh, You know, taking the time to connect with as many Ontarians as I can. Uh, It's tough, right? I mean, it's being on the road a lot of the time. Uh, But it's it's been really important because it enables me and and our party and our, our caucus to be able to speak really from where people are at about the issues that matter to them. And I think that's been really crucial. So I, I love that. I, I mean, I love this province. It's extremely beautiful and I knew it was, but I've gotten a chance to see some corners that I hadn't seen before. Um, and uh, and it's, been, it's been really eye-opening. It's been a real pleasure and a, and a real privilege too, I'll tell you. Now, yeah. obviously, there's some there's some learning experience that comes with the job, and and I, I hate to harp on a subject that you have talked a lot about, but MPP Sarah Jama here in Hamilton, mm-hmm. obviously, you've made your decision to to move on from her in the caucus. What did you take away from from that experience? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I mean, obviously, uh, any leader, let alone a new leader, no, no party leader wants to lose one of their MPPs. Uh, certainly not what I was hoping uh, this year would look like. Um, but uh, at the same time, uh, we also have to make tough decisions. Uh, that are in the best interests of our, our party and our caucus. Uh, we are a very united caucus, uh, and we we need to be able to move forward in a very united way on the issues that are really front and center for so many Ontarians. We have a very big and important job to do. Um, you know, I'll, I'll use the example just for a moment of the state of health care. Uh, when people out there are waiting for urgent care and it's not there when you need it. That's really scary. Uh, that is our job as Ontario MPPs and as the official opposition in Ontario. It's our job to make sure 
that people get the care they need when they need it. It has to be our priority. So, you know, I I, uh, I look forward, I will say, <clears throat> to continuing to work with MPP JAMA, uh, to certainly, you know, continuing to re represent the interests of the people of Hamilton Centre. The NDP has represented uh, Hamilton Centre for many, many years, and we're going to continue to do so. Uh, but, you know, again, these are tough decisions, and sometimes that's uh, the call that the leader has to make. Uh, we'll get back to health care because, of course, here, you know, with our viewership in the Niagara region, uh, they obviously want their urgent care center hours 24-7 uh, right. back in Port Colborne. We are going to get to that. But just on a point, a final point on, on Sarah Jama, uh, is there a path to her back to the party? And, and have you reached out? Has she reached out? Is, is that a possibility at all? Well, we've certainly um, reached out with support um, to make sure that she could set herself up in the best way possible to continue to serve her um, her constituents. And we've opposed the government's really outrageous and undemocratic censure of MPP JAMA. It's, it's really outrageous that she's not able to speak in the legislature on behalf of her uh, of her constituents. We we've offered, you know, we we've, we've, we've as I've said publicly many times, like happy to continue to work with her on issues. Um, you know, and I look forward to in the next little while having a chance for our, our folks to sit down and, and talk about what that might look like. Uh, let's continue our look back on 2023. You you you, you take a credit for the green belt reversal that the Ford government announced. You give Hamiltonians credit for their fighting the MZO uh, MZO reversals as well. When you look back on that green belt, what do you hope the message that that was sent to Doug Ford is? Well, look, I mean, Doug Ford made that decision uh, for all the wrong reasons, right? There's no question, and I, I'm not afraid to call it corruption. I believe that there's corruption behind this, uh, and I think that those corrupt policies, that corruption was was a major reason why the government uh, made a whole bunch of decisions that they've made recently, including expanding the urban boundaries uh, and other things. And so um, I, I hope if if uh, if anything, we've, we've learned from the last year, I hope the government has learned that it, it doesn't pay uh, to make these corrupt decisions. Uh, we need to be making decisions based on evidence, uh, based on what the experts, including their own experts, are telling them, uh, and based on what's going to actually meet the needs of Ontarians. We have wasted uh, precious time at least a year, possibly years, uh, um, wasted time on this corrupt scandal uh, instead of actually building the housing that Ontarians need. And let's not forget, that's what they were supposed to be doing here. This was supposed to be about building housing for Ontarians in a housing crisis. And now we are back and further behind than ever before. So housing starts are down not up. Uh, we are not building the truly affordable housing that we need. Uh, and, you know, I wish that the government would, rather than listen to uh, land speculators uh, and donors in their party, instead actually listen to the experts and also listen to the opposition, because we have some good ideas too. Uh, we know how to build a truly affordable housing. Uh, we know that there needs to be a place for non-market housing in the province of Ontario if we're going to actually meet the needs of people in this province. The election is 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 so far away, 2026. I mean, it, it feels like it's so far away, but we are already into 2024, I guess yeah. I should say. Uh, how does how do you keep the green belt front of mind? There's still an RCMP investigation. We don't know what will come of that, but a lot of people are thinking this is going to be in the rearview mirror for the Ford government. People will be talking about alcohol in corner stores come 2026. How does the NDP plan on keeping this front and center in voters' minds when the next election is still a little over two years away? Well, look, uh, it's not over. I think that's the, the, the short answer, unfortunately. I think there's a whole lot more corruption in the Ford government to expose and that we've only scratched the surface of the Greenbelt scandal itself. Uh, the RCMP investigation is still looming. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Doug Ford uh, is continuing to fight journalists in court to keep his personal phone records a secret, even where he's conducted government business. Um, and, and we know that there's also an Auditor General report that I requested on um, the Ontario Place scheme, which we believe is also uh, something where there's going to be a whole lot more uh, to it uh, that's still to come. So there's going to be a lot. So, um, And this is important because we are not going to stop reminding Ontarians as well 
that we can push and we can get wins. Uh, we won together uh, in forcing the government to backtrack on the green belt, on the urban boundaries, on the MZOs, on Bill 28, uh, on the Peel dissolution. And we're going to keep pushing on things like the uh, privatization of health care, uh, other issues where we know the government is headed in a direction that the people of Ontario oppose. And we can keep winning. So my plan as we head toward 2026 is to keep holding this government to account, to help uh, pushing back on their bad decisions and bad policy, and, and at the same time, to, to move forward uh, with new ideas, uh, with good policy, good ideas, concrete solutions to the very real struggles that Ontarians are facing right now. And we've been doing that and we're going to keep doing it. There's a lot that this government could be doing to make life easier for Ontarians. Now, uh, you, you mentioned making life easier. Uh, a lot of people I've talked to over Christmas have talked about affordability, affordability, affordability. And that yeah. goes with housing as, you know, whether you're going to be able to afford your mortgage payment or whether your, your, your rent is going to go up a, an exorbitant amount. What is the NDP's policy when it comes to housing right now? How could we get more housing bill? What would you say to Doug Ford if he came to you and asked for some advice on this file? Mm -hmm. Well, um, and I'll tell you, we, we put this forward to him on a number of occasions and we will keep doing it. We put it forward in legislation and in debates uh, over and over again. And, and here's what we're suggesting. First of all, um, we, we have to get housing built quicker, absolutely. But they also have to be homes that people can actually afford. Uh, so that means, and this is why we presented this proposal for something we're calling Homes Ontario, where we are proposing that we get back in the business of actually, of government, actually building housing, which we used to do up until the mid 90s. So, you know, let's get back into the business of building truly affordable and non market homes in existing neighborhoods where people want to live. Um, that's one thing. And then the other thing that you just cannot ignore is the importance of real rent control. So many people in this province um, are renting and we need to bring back rent control to stop the, the skyrocketing rent increases uh, in this province. It's, it's forcing people to make choices between you know paying rent and feeding their children i mean that's a choice nobody should have to make uh you also in a recent toronto star op-ed you're kind of recapping your year and looking ahead to 24 you talk about child care and of course health care and i do want to move on to health care because uh, as mentioned there are two urgent care centers you have a very vocal mpp and wayne gates out there in, in fort erie and niagara really? falls yeah. um and we've seen port colburn uh, urgent care centers closed these are originally emergency rooms that became urgent care centers which are now closed between the hours of 8 p.m. and 10 a.m. There are a lot of seniors that live out there. I, you know, my parents have a, a cottage out there in Crystal Beach. Knowing that the closed hospital is 45 minutes away, what is your solution to reopen those emergency and urgent care centers? Mm -hmm. Well, look, first of all, it's really important. And by the way, being out there uh, talking to people in those very communities you're talking about. And, and as I said earlier, you know, I, what I hear from people is how scary it is, right? How really, truly scary it is when your child or a family member is in need of urgent or emergency care and you don't know when it's arriving, when you're going to get it. And we've heard so many uh, terrible, terrible stories. I've personally, you know, directly have been listening to people who've told me uh, some of the terrible uh, things that have happened. Um, so look, this is a human resource crisis, right? This is about staffing. Uh, it's about staffing in every corner of this province now, and it's only gotten worse. So we had, you know, hallway health care under the Liberals. Uh, now it's like garage health care under the Conservatives. It's just getting worse and not better. And um, unless we address those staffing shortages, and, and that doesn't just mean pay, by the way, although pay is, is certainly part of it, no question. Um, we, we are finding increasingly, of course, that um, people are... Uh, sorry, is that is there? I hear all kinds yeah. of noise going on out there. We're, we're just we're just playing some of those uh, nurses that are uh, that yeah. are protesting for higher pay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know what? And like, and the thing about it is, you know, thank goodness our nurses and other healthcare workers have been speaking up about this because it's not just about pay. I mean, <clears throat> look, the government has been fighting uh, for years now to in court to suppress 
healthcare workers' wages. And that just, you know, at a certain point, it's just deeply disrespectful of the work they do. But also, they have the money, right? They're sitting on a $22 billion contingency fund, a rainy day fund, and they don't want to spend those dollars when the crisis is here and it's now. So there's things they could be doing right now. I'm going to be uh, releasing some information over the next couple of days about some very specific things that the government can be doing. Um, but but I would say, you know, actually paying uh, nurses a decent wage and other healthcare workers, stop fighting them in court, um, stop diverting our public healthcare dollars into uh, these private nursing agencies, which are just literally our hospitals are hemorrhaging dollars out to those staffing agencies. And we've called for the government to cap how much we can actually pay to those agencies to, to push you know more of those dollars back into the healthcare system. Stop the privatization of healthcare. You know, stop diverting those public dollars out of our hospitals and into private agencies and and clinics. And uh, you know, I think all of those things will go a long way uh, to helping sort things out. Um, but there has to be there has to be respect. Uh, there has to be uh, an interest in 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 actually listening to the frontline health care workers. Um, absolutely. I uh, want to go back to 2022 just on the point and you know I've talked to a lot of people about politics obviously on this show and then outside in my regular life and it's hard to get people interested in in politics I find you know we look at the turnout rate of the 2022 provincial election the lowest ever uh, you know around that 42 percent mark what's the NDP's plan in getting people more involved particularly young people but people in general 42 percent of the province of eligible voters deciding on who's going to be representing them doesn't sound fair. What's your plan to get that number up? Yeah, it's isn't it? I mean, it really is awful. And I'll tell you, it's the reason, the main reason why I decided to run to be the leader of the um, NDP uh, was coming out of the last election. And I don't fault you know anyone in particular for this, by the way. Uh, but I, I I do feel like something is missing. And and I I really believe it's that um, people have lost hope. Uh, they've lost hope that politicians can fix the problems that they're facing in their everyday lives, that it's relevant and it matters, like you said. And um, and so I think it's on us as elected um, leaders to to inspire people, to believe that we can actually get things done and and to show them how it's how it works. Right. I mean, I don't think it's any small thing that we have managed to push this government back on their heels on almost every major policy decision they made and announced this year. Uh, that shows you that it matters uh, who you elect. It matters um, that people let us know what their priorities are, that they speak up when they're unhappy with how things are going, um, that your voice matters and that your vote matters too. Our, our electoral system isn't doesn't work particularly well that way, I'll say as well. That's a, a whole discussion for another day. But uh, basically, I, I look to you know the words of uh, of uh, my uh, our, our friend and our former leader, of course, Jack Layton, who talked about bringing back you know hope and optimism. And I think that is what is missing right now. And I think a lot of people, you know, especially through the pandemic. Um, their, their standards got real low about what they could expect from government. Uh, we can do a lot better in this province, and it's up to us to show people how. In the theme of, of hope and optimism, and in the theme of it being the new year, what are you optimistic about in 2024, mm -hmm. Marit? Well, I'm, I'm optimistic that we can make things better. I, I truly am. Uh, I, I wouldn't be doing what I do if I didn't believe that we could make change. Uh, and I don't want to wait till 2026 to do that. I, in 2026, I absolutely want to form government, and I want to I want to lead Ontario, and I want to build a better province that works for workers, for people in this province. Um, but in the meantime, I want to try to get the government to work with us, with Ontarians, uh, to do good things. Uh, we have to address the crisis in healthcare, uh, and it has to start now. We can't wait till 2026 because people simply can't afford it. And we need to address the cost of living crisis. Like it breaks my heart. I, I go everywhere I go in this province, I'm visiting, um, you know, food banks and uh, their numbers are up every everywhere. Uh, and I know folks in the region um, are experiencing that too. And in many parts of the province, they're up 25, 30% um, in the last year, uh, over half of them, uh, over a quarter of the people coming into food banks in the last year were 
first time food bank users. These are people with part time jobs, full time jobs. Um, they're going to food banks because that's the last, this is the last straw. They have to uh, in order to make the rent or make mortgage payments sometimes. And I think that's a really sad state of affairs. Uh, we can do better. But it's going to take all of us in government and opposition uh, pushing um, to make those changes and to get you know some of those big companies as well to to sit down with us and uh, and figure out ways that we can we can reduce the cost for people. Uh, but but government is part of that, and this government has a lot of power to do good. Uh, they need to be thinking about the people of this province and not just their donors and not just their friends. Um, and it's my job to make sure that they hear those other voices. Now, uh, I, I mentioned off the top, you are the first uh, provincial party leader to join us. Uh, you won't be the last. Uh, Ms. Crombie's, uh, Ms. Crombie is joining us next week. Mr. Schreiner is joining us next week as well. Uh, Mr. Ford has oh, not right. gotten back to us yet. Uh, but I do want to ask you about uh, about Ms. Crom Ms. Crombie. Excuse me. Uh, uh, you've called her cut from the same cloth as Doug Ford. Uh, what do you mean by that? And, and why is she not the right choice for Ontarians? Well, look, I mean, I, I don't think there's a lot of difference in the sort of policies and approach of um, uh, the Ford Conservatives or the, the, the Liberals under this leader. Um, <clears throat> but at the end of the day, you know, what I see, and I think a lot of Ontarians see, is they see uh, Doug Ford and Bonnie Crombie arguing over, you know, who has a nice luxury car, who has a bigger vacation home. Uh, the fact is the Liberals, uh, they're in a different in a different path than we are in the NDP right now. Um, they have to uh, they have to gain party status to be recognized again in the legislature. Uh, Ms. Crombie has to uh, win a seat. Um, <coughs> but excuse me. But as official opposition, um, we are going to stay focused on holding the government to account and making life easier and more affordable for people. And that's my absolute laser focus. Ms. Stiles, I very much appreciate you making the time. It's uh, great for you to lay out uh, your, your vision for 24, 2024 uh, for Hamiltonians, of course, so with a couple of Hamiltonian MPPs. Anyone who watches this, I'm sure, uh, knows who to reach out to uh, to get a hold of them. Uh, but thank Andy you for making Scott, the time. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for making the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. My thanks to Marit Stiles for joining me today. Of course, the leader of the Ontario NDP and the official leader of the opposition in the Ontario legislature. My thanks to you for joining us as well. As mentioned, Bonnie Crombie will be on the show next week. Mike Schreiner uh, will be on the show next week as well. That being this show, Newsmakers. Uh, and again, my, my invitation to uh, Premier Ford is open. Uh, and if you'd like to respond to my emails, you can. I would love to have all four of them. But uh, my thanks to Marit Stiles for joining me today. My thanks to Mike Corston for directing today's show. Happy birthday, Mike. Uh, and once again, my thanks to you for checking us out. However you found us on CHCH Podcasts, uh, wherever you find your favorite podcast, or you go to chch.com slash podcasts. And from all of us here at CHCH, I'm Louis Butko, hoping you have a great day.